When I was at prep school, about nine years old, and my mistress was talking about the book of Genesis and how the world was created in a week. And she was saying, you know, we should treat it as an interesting story, but not consider that everything was exactly true. And one of the boys who was um, in the class stood up and said, but my father says everything in the Bible is true. And of course, this put her in a bit of an awkward spot. She didn't want to go against re religious teaching. So she paused for a moment. I can remember it very clearly, although I was nine years old. I remember the position of her, the desk, the boy, the chairs. And she said, when you grow up Sutton, that was his name, you'll realize that grown-ups aren't always right. And I can remember the depth of that statement, and it has influenced me for the whole of the rest of my life. If someone tells me something, I say, yes, interesting. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder how true that is and how it fits in with all the other things. And it just makes me a bit of a suspicious chap. Anyway, um, uh, I didn't do well at school. I was bottom of the class most of the time. And it wasn't until I struggled through and got my qualification and started practice that I think I really learned anything much about dentistry at all. Um, initially, I was interested in surgery. I wanted to be, I think, a famous surgeon. Who wouldn't? So I went to what was actually, at the time, the best centre in the whole world. They were dealing with all the um, pilots who were coming back from the war with really severe facial injuries. And therefore, it was, I think, without doubt, the most advanced surgical unit for faces anywhere in the world. And I was learning from the very best people who were surrounded by the very best um, students. And so it was exceedingly good for me. Anyway, um, there I developed the idea of the structure of the face and how it's supported mainly by the maxilla, the upper jaw, and the mandible, the lower jaw, and how they relatively grow to different shapes. And that basically is what creates a facial identity. What I didn't really like about the unit was the lifestyle and the attitudes of surgeons, all who seemed to be uh, great drama queens. You know, I've seen surgeons throw instruments across the theatre floor. Um, really, that wasn't that uncommon. They were very emotional people. I decided this is not for me. But I was already by then very interested in the development of the face, and particularly the teeth. So I thought, I'll switch into orthodontics. And it wasn't until then I decided to do orthodontics. And of course, it was several years after that that I actually um, qualified as an orthodontist. But the same feature about the uh, orthognathic surgery was the way they would move the upper jaw forward and the really quite dramatic improvement that this would create to the whole of the face. And I was quite impressed by this. People would come in for surgery looking really very ordinary. You'd move the upper jaw forward and it suddenly looked much better. So that really impressed me. But I found to my great interest that during my orthodontic training, most orthodontists pull the top jaw back. I didn't realize why at the time. Now I know it's because they don't think you can move the lower jaw forward. Therefore, if the teeth are a bit like this, you have to move the upper jaw back. There's no but, other but way. Can you remember the moment that you started uh, questioning the orthodontics and trying to find another path? Well, I was already full of some conflicting messages from the surgeons and the orthodontists. So my mind was very busily trying to resolve those. My father was really quite a philosopher. And one of the things he taught me is there is a reason for everything. Now, due to possibly my stubborn nature, I just cannot relax on knowing there is a reason 
but not knowing what that reason is. Therefore, whenever I see a contradiction or just an unexplained phenomena, I feel there has to be an answer here. And so I feel, in a sense, under an obligation to find the answer for that. I feel that's my job, particularly if I'm treating patients and they have a problem, then it's my job to answer that problem. And there were, I think, uh, were and still are, a huge number of completely unanswered, very serious problems about medicine generally, but in particular the growth of the body and even in more particular the growth of the face. We are all the same human beings, yet all our faces are different. Do you know the variation in the shape of the face is far greater than the variation in the shape of any other part of the body? That is a fascinating bit of information. But of course, there has to be a reason for that. Why is it? Now, at that time, I was fixing all these things together in my mind, and I then came across the thought, well, if we take um, an animal like a crocodile, they have arms, well, the jaws, should I say, about that long, that's about six foot of jaw by the time you've gone all the way around, two meters for you continentals. Anyway, now, the crocodile will only survive if his teeth meet perfectly. If the teeth are like that or like that, he'll die. Now, that is a, what they call in uh, an evolutionary terms a very strong driving factor. Therefore, all the animals who are like that or like that die, but only the ones that are like that live. Now, because every crocodile has to have their teeth meeting, there has to be a mechanism for that to happen. The, the actual growth process is not that accurate. Therefore, I realize there has to be a growth modification system that ensures the teeth meet properly, both for humans and crocodiles. These were just some of the thoughts that were rattling around in my mind as I gradually formed this. What really made a big, big difference was I was treating a young girl and uh, I, by then I thought I was fairly competent at getting jaws to grow and things to move around. I was using functional appliances, which is, uh, I now think, rather an inefficient method, but it's still used a lot all around the world. Anyway, these functional methods did generally help to move the jaws in the right direction. But this girl had her lower jaw set back a little bit, not badly, so I thought it would be quite a simple matter to get it to grow forward. Lower jaw? Yes, her lower jaw was back. The yeah. mandible, the maxilla was in yeah. the more or less right position. She was quite a pretty girl. And that to me now indicates that her maxilla was in the right position. But she, for some reason, instead of biting up round this appliance, she dropped down and bite a bit behind it which was a bit unusual, and then very quickly I found that her lower jaw was going back. I thought, help, that's all right. So I stopped the appliance, but it went on going back, and on, and on, and on. And I was absolutely horrified as this attractive girl became more and more unattractive. And I was at my wit's end. I was relatively junior, I'd only been graduated a couple of years or so. So I went back to my teaching hospital and said, look, what's happening? And I, I can remember the two deans looked at her and examined her very thoroughly. And in the end they said, John, don't worry, it's nothing to do with you. Um, uh, it's just the way she's growing, it's her genetic growth. Because they, as I'm afraid most orthodontists to this day believe that this shape of the face is inherited. Whereas by then, I had already decided it was environmental, that is, it changes depending what you do in order for the teeth to meet. Anyway, um, I <coughs> had a tremendous conscience about this. I felt I had destroyed this girl's life, and in the truth, I believe I did. But 
I made it my life's task from that moment on, and I can remember making that decision, that I would make this up. I would discover why it had gone wrong, and I would ensure that it never happened to anyone else. Now, I've seen it happen to a lot of other people since, but I always sit by them and say, oh, I know why it's happened. And I realize why it happened is simply because she was keeping her mouth open. I hadn't realized what a huge influence that makes. But there, I've come across other evidence since. I mean, children who've accidentally got blocked noses, their face just totally changes for no other reason they have a blocked nose. I've watched people who have got muscular dystrophy, their muscles waste away and have no power, and the whole face just drops down and is destroyed. So these were the basis on which I thought there must, it must be possible to reverse these um, things. If things are going wrong, it must be a physiological change. And if it's a physiological change, it must go both ways. You can't have something will only go one way. So that is what made me um, uh, develop the whole science, if you can call it that, of orthotropics, which is almost in total confrontation with orthodontics. Um, and I never intended to confront the orthodontists. I didn't want to. They were my friends. But I was believing one thing and they were believing another. And gradually it drove us apart. And I don't think I'm particularly aggressive to them now, but they are certainly very aggressive to me, just because I have a different opinion.